Your Excellencies, the Honorable Minister of Transportation, and the fortnight inaugural lecturer, the fortnight convocation lecturer, your Imperial Majesty, God bless you, the highly revered monarch or judge, to the owner of Ife and Chancellor, the University of Nigeria. Permit me to call upon the Chairman, Senior Ceremonial Committee, Professor Bennett Wanguma, to anchor the fortnight convocation lecture of the University of Nigeria. Professor Bennett Wanguma. The Chancellor, the Visitor to the University of Nigeria, the Vice Chancellor, His Excellencies, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to anchor the fortnight convocation lecture of the University of Nigeria. As you know, the convocation lecture is one of the high points of the convocation ceremony of the University of Nigeria. And when it became impossible to hold the lecture on Thursday as was scheduled, we went to work and were delighted that the fortnight convocation lecturer, His Excellency, the Right Honorable Rotemichi Bikamechi, the Honorable Minister of Transportation, agreed to attend our convocation to give the convocation lecture today. And so, like the Vice Chancellor said, we're having a convocation ceremony like no other, where the award of postgraduate degrees and diplomas is combined with a convocation lecture. So, it's my pleasure at this point to invite the university orator, Dr. Ikenna Onwebuda, to read the citation on the 49th Convocation Lecturer of the University of Nigeria, the Right Honorable Rotimi Chibike Amechi. The orator, please. The visitor to the university, Honorable Chancellor, sir. Permit me to stand on protocol already established to read the citation of the 49th Convocation Lecturer of the University of Nigeria. Right, Honorable His Excellency Chibike Rotimi Amechi. Inspiration and perspiration are often considered as the dual ingredients in the negotiation of the passion that ultimately produces the genius. Yet at times, it is a congruent collaboration of adventure and investiture that promotes our prince to vacate his vegetable and venture into the gaping gulf of the unknown. And if he returns victoriously, he is celebrated. Today, we engage with the 49th Convocation Lecturer of the University of Nigeria, our compassionate compatriots, an indefatigable leader, an open and transparent administrator, an exemplary executive, a many-sided technocrat, a highly creative public servant, and a worthy Nigerian. A native of Ubima, Ikwere local government area of River State, Nigeria, born on May 27, 1965, graduate of the University of Port Harcourt, former president, National Union of River State Students and National Association of Students. His Excellency, Right Honorable Chibike Rotimi Amechi, Commander of the Order of Nigeria.
Oye, ze meka o. Unu biala we. Meka o. The 49th Convocation Lecturer of the University of Nigeria is a two-time seven Honorable Minister of Transportation, Federal Republic of Nigeria, a former two-tenor Executive Governor of River State, a former Chairman of Nigeria Governors Forum, a former Special Assistant to the Deputy Governor River State, a former Chairman of the Conference of Speakers of State Assemblies, on his way to the top, he was a state secretary, caretaker committee, Democratic Party of Nigeria, secretary, National Republican Convention, equally local government area, board member, West Africa Glass Industry, board member, Reese's Palm Nigeria Limited, and public relations officer, Pamu Clinics and Hospital Limited. The workaholic minister, as he is fondly called, has revamped the Nigerian railway sector by introducing world standard gauge rail lines. Faster locomotive trains, coaches, and wagons. To his credit is the completion of the Abuja Kaduna rail line contracting the lagos Ibadokano rail line and delivery of the lagos Ibado section with massive state-of-the-art train station extending into the Apapa seaport. He completed the Wari Itakbe rail line, kick-started the Kano Maradi rail line, Port Harcourt Medugri rail line, Bonnie Deep Seaport, and Railway Industrial Park, Port Harcourt, while working on contracting the Lagos Calabar Coastal Rail Line. His Excellency, Right Honorable Amechi, the Honorable Minister of Transportation, holds the enviable credit of establishing a wagon assembly plant in Kajola to make Nigeria self sufficient in the production of wagons locomotives, and other rail rolling stocks. A transportation university in Katsina, a multidisciplinary university in River State, and the training of Nigerian students in Chinese universities on railway engineering. He just launched the Integrated National Maritime Surveillance and security infrastructure projects, also known as the Deep Blue Project. This venture would ensure the safety and security of Nigeria's territorial waters and protect maritime trade in the Gulf of Guinea. You wonder why he wasn't here on Thursday. Those of you who are on television would have seen that this workaholic minister would stop at nothing to transform the image of Nigeria and make his ministry the richest in Nigeria. Speaking on economic justice and national security, conquering insecurity through combating poverty, permit me, Honorable Chancellor, to call to the lectern the 49th Convocation Lecturer of the University of Nigeria, Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Transportation, His Excellency, Right Honorable Chibike Rotimi Amechi. Let me start by saying everything must not be politics. So please, 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 let's face academics. 
Your Excellency, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the visitor to the University of Nigeria, Nsuka, represented by my friend and brother, the Minister of State for Education. The Chancellor of the Great Investor of Nigeria, Nsuka, Your Majesty. The Vice Chancellor and your beautiful wife and the management of the University of Nigeria and Suka. The academics or the all the faculties. The graduates, the great lions and lionesses. Let me greet all of you and apologize for intruding in your celebration time. Usually, convocation lectures precede graduation ceremonies. Unfortunately, on, or fortunately, anyone, Thursday was the day we had to commission the Lagos Ibadan Railway and the Deep Blue Project. And I agreed with the school, the management of the school to be here on Saturday to deliver or share this, my thoughts with you. Let me congratulate all of you who are graduating today and ask for God to bless all of you. I'm grateful to, this, to the Vice Chancellor and the management of the school for inviting me. Indeed, I'm deeply honored to have been invited to deliver this year's convocation lecture at the most renowned citadel of, citadel of learning, culture, and research. Mr. Vice Chancellor, I thank you specifically for deeming it appropriate to ask me to wade through the usual dividing lines between government, town, and gown to address this August gathering. On this occasion, I'm wearing many caps. I am a minister of the federal government of Nigeria, a servant of the government and people of Nigeria. I'm also an avid lover of learning and knowledge, a voracious consumer of books. When an overcrowded schedule makes it possible, I cannot forget that I'm a product of a remarkable Nigerian university, the unique University of Port Harcourt. I'm currently enrolled as a student, full-time, of the Bayes University in Abuja, where I am currently studying law. I am also a part-time student of the University of London, where I am also studying a first degree in law, and you ask why. The reason is that the vice, the vice president accused me of influencing lecturers because of my status in government. That's why they will never fail me at Bayes University. So I decided to pursue the same degree at University of London, where I don't meet the lecturers at all. So that if, when I get the two degrees, I'll go back to the VP and say, sir, look at the two degrees. And then he will know that I wasn't influencing any lecturer. If you add the, the on-the-job training and learning that I'm currently receiving in the area of rails and railways, you can imagine how involved I am in the world of learning. It is this combination of interest in the world of learning and knowledge that emboldened me to accept the invitation of the vice chancellor to share my thoughts on the subject of this lecture with this distinguished audience. And you may ask, what is the subject of the lecture? Inequality and the dignity of man. And I'm sure that every student and graduate of the University of Nigeria and Soka would know what the dignity of man means. It is this combination of interest in the world of learning and knowledge that embodies, okay, the moment of graduation holds special meaning for both the graduates and their parents. For those graduating, it is the fulfillment of a set of hopes, the completion of one leg of a race in life and the beginning of yet another lap. 
The world outside the university campus holds infinite possibilities and surprises. It is different from what you have on campus. It is real and sometimes shocking. But it holds the invaluable treasure of experience without which we cannot face life. I hope you all find it an exciting ride, especially in our time and place. In a world of dwindling opportunities and immense challenges, I urge you to embrace the realities with courage and determination. Above all, you require all the creativity to convert every challenge to an opportunity. To the parents and guardians, I congratulate you also for escorting these young ones through one of life's critical gateways. What you have given your offspring and words is a rare privilege in a world of unequal opportunities. A university degree in every society remains a prized gift for the minority who are blessed to have the parents and guardians who can afford to give it. As you witness this ceremony, I urge you to share with fortitude the challenges that these younger ones will have to face in the years ahead. The University of Nigeria and Soka, a place founded on dignity. Because of the circumstances of its founding, the name and founding philosophy of the of, uh, University of Nigeria and Soka marked it out as a leading national center of premium excellence. By its name, the University of Nigeria assumed a position of unique leadership from inception. As it were, other major Nigerian universities, universities, including the few older ones, initially needed to define themselves to the outside world in relation to the University of Nigeria and Soka. They need to prove that they were not offshoots, offshoots or branches of the University of Nigeria. The assumption then was that Nigeria had only one umbrella university with multiple branches. From the onset, therefore, this university was founded on the noble ideals of nationalism, national unity, and the promise of national greatness. I am made to understand that for a long time, whenever graduates of this university, of this university interacted with graduates from other first generation universities in the country, there was always a contest of superiority or primacy. Why the Nsuka graduates, why the Nsuka graduates boasted jovially that they are graduates of the only university in Nigeria? Why seeing the others as products of provincial or personal centers? The others who rebel and accuse the Nsuka graduates of undue arrogance and an appropriating mentality. Let me register my protest as one of those who rebel against the tyranny and arrogance of pioneer universities, like the University of Nigeria and Soka. I'm a proud product of a third generation Nigerian university, a very innovative and adventurous center of learning and cutting edge research in the humanities, social sciences, and oil related studies. I'm a product of the University of Port Harcourt. I'm not one of those likely to be drowned or intimidated by the pioneering, pioneering status or the overbearing and presumptive nomenclature of the University of Nigeria and Soka. <laughs> it can't intimidate me. <laughs> now that we have a whole gamut of federal, state, private, specialized, and purely commercial universities on an industrial scale, I assume that the ego wars must have died down. The University of Nigeria and its graduates can happily take their front row, their front row seat, and bask in their pioneering status. Nsuka graduates can justifiably celebrate the dignity and tradition that age confers on universities, if nothing else. But in a competitive world in which the frontiers of planning continue to expand exponentially, 
No institution can relax on its past glory. Innovation and rapid technological advancement make institutional complacency a luxury. It's a matter of dignity. Indeed, in the ranking of universities, tradition counts for a great deal. The tradition of, of any university is usually the consolidation of its founding philosophy into a guiding inspiration and enabling mantra. This is what guides the university's research, teaching, and general academic direction over time. Successive generations of staff and students come to imbibe this tradition in their interactions and academic endeavors. It becomes the driving force of their pride in the institution through which they pass. Thus, Harvard, Yale, MIT, Oxford, and Cambridge are not just fancy names. They are traditions rooted in history and founding philosophies like University of Nigeria and Soka. The great Zeke of Africa who founded this university was not a man to be lost in the quest for tradition and enabling philosophy. His love for knowledge and tradition knew no bounds. Therefore, from the onset, he powered this institution with an enabling philosophy which is embodied in its motto. It simply, it simply states that the overriding objective of this institution shall be to restore the dignity of man. Set against the nationalist struggle against colonialism and its informing racism, this was a heavy mandate for a university. But Dr. Zikwe was first and foremost a man of infinite love for learning. In his generation, time and place in African history, knowledge and education were perhaps the most important means of validating the dignity and humanity of the black man. The black man and woman owed it to his race and to humanity to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he had the ability to acquire the highest level of knowledge possible. Zeke was confident that beyond emancipation himself from slavery, I'm sorry, beyond, Zeke was confident that beyond emancipating himself from slavery and colonialism, the black man had a valid civilization and a worthy contribution to make to the match of human civilization. Nowhere else would the impact of such contribution be felt than in the world of learning and the pursuit of knowledge through cutting edge teaching and research. That single attribute was all that was required to disprove the supremacist assumption of racism and colonialism. From inception, therefore, the great Sikh of Africa endowed this university with a civilizing and liberationist ideology and mission. As it were, the acquisition of Western education and learning in all disciplines and the pursuit of excellence for the African mind were the prerequisite for the restoration of the dignity of the African man, which centuries of slave trade colonialism and imperialism had de denigrated. That, in my understanding, is one of the reasons why we are gathered here today. The changing challenges to human dignity. For me and for the purpose of this lecture, the operative word is dignity. The dignity of man and woman will be the sum total of all that makes us human as distinct from beasts. The dignity of man can be degraded by so many factors beyond the classic categories of racism, colonialism, deliberate denigration and enslavement. It is now centuries since the formal end of the slave trade. It has also been dec decades since the last African colonies secured political independence to become sovereign nation. It is true that we still have the vestiges of imperialism and economic dependence as burdens in today's world. Racism is still alive and well, Black peoples and the rest of the world still have cause to mount worldwide protests that proclaim Black Lives Matter. That cry is a defiant reassertion of a dignity that still continues to be trodden upon, holding thousands of corpses of those who could not be buried by frightened relations and family. In the Sahel region of Africa, a desperate climate change challenge has reduced millions of humanity to scratchy existence in a hostile desert environment to live undignified lives. In Nigeria's secure, insecure villages and towns, we are witnessing the dignity of women who defied and assaulted In 
international community, we are all witnesses to the increasing inequality among nations. While the few developed economies and nations of the East and West can afford most of the indices of decent living for the major, majority of their citizens, majority of the nations of the world, especially in Africa, are saddled with economies that cannot survive without piles of debt and politics that cannot exist without aid. But I'm constrained by my topic to dwell on poverty and the concomitant inequality and how both of them constitute the most dear and urgent challenge to the, the dignity of man in Africa, especially in Nigeria. In recent years, Nigeria has become the home of one of the largest populations of poor people in the world. In recent parlance, some have referred to Nigeria as the new poverty capital of the world. With an estimated poor population of over 100 million people, our national poverty rate is 50% of the total population and still growing. This is not exactly a flattering statistics. The causes are many and varied, but all come down to a mismatch between resources and demographic trends. No one can deny the serial lack of management of our resources by successive administrations. Equally to be blamed is our continuing over-dependence on oil rents and royalties as the mainstay of our economic survival. Consequently, the resource base of the federal government has continued to come under increasing severe pressure with attendant devaluation in extent and quality of basic social services and the major indices of human development. The population of the country has grown exponentially from 55.98 million in 1970 to over 201 million in 2019 and about 10, 210 million today. Similarly, our per capita per head has grown from $224 in 1970 to $2,149 today. But the purchasing power of the current higher figure is less than what the smaller figure will buy in 1970. Only an average of 20% of Nigeria's 1970 population could be regarded as poor. Increasingly, however, even the most avid races are now a bit reluctant to display their prejudices openly. In fact, after the official police lynching of George Floyd in the streets of Minneapolis and in the era of Black Lives Matter, it has become fashionable for known racist individuals and corporations to make a show of not being racist. Product labels have been hurriedly changed. Huge corporations have begun to review their racial quotas for employment and career advancement. That is some progress on the matter of restoring the dignity of the black man at least. Interestingly, the world has come to the rude awakening that every act of indignity against black people is a further degradation of the dignity of the races themselves. Racism is no longer just a blight on those discriminated against, but more a devaluation of the dignity and humanity of the races as well. The wheel has come full circle. This is why every major sporting tournament in the world is now preceded by the symbolic taking of the knee to show our common solidarity in the campaign against racism and all forms of discrimination. That is how far humanity has come on the matter of human dignity. There are still many treacherous rivers to cross. We now live in a world where a variety of factors have arisen that constantly reduce the dignity of our common humanity. The tribe of humanity that is in desperate want of dignity in one way or the other now traverses national continental. I jumped this because of time tackling poverty and inequality. The prevalence of poverty has been recognized as one of the greatest threats to our national unity and national security. In my mind, I see the poverty burden as the greatest threat to the situation of the dignity of the Nigerian persons. Poverty has become a leveler and a unifier, even in a time of political and ethnic fundamentalism and divisiveness. Come to think of it, there is no discrimination between the poor, or, the poor man or woman in Meduguri and the one in Portacot, between the poor woman in Inegua and their opposite number in Sekoto, they all speak the same di dialect of the Nigerian language. They are hungry, homeless, and sometimes hopeless. I have repeatedly said that poverty is an issue about which I do not need to be lectured by anyone. I grew up in the inner city of Diobu in Portacot. I know about a crowded home with a whole family living in a modest apartment. I know the pangs of hunger when the little available has to be shared among many siblings. I know the uncertainty of a future where school fees may not be paid on time. I know of the misery of a Christmas that will pass without new clothes or gifts from parents, not because they love you any less. I have a personal conviction that of all the challenges facing our nation's isolation, none is more urgent than the scourge of increasing poverty and the threat of mass inequality. Nigeria must attack 
and conquer extreme poverty and inequality, or the poor will overrun the rest of Nigeria. And that can account for this NSAS and all that. Let us take the threat of mass poverty seriously and elevate inequality to the status of a perennial national emergency in the years ahead. Nearly all the troubles that confront us as a nation can be traced to either direct poverty or the fear that the order of poverty could rise one day to devour the fortunes of the rich and prosperous. Perhaps, perhaps the reduction of desperate poverty should be the first step in fostering genuine national unity in the years ahead. Only then will most Nigerians speak the same language and understand each other better. Left alone in their present poor and hopeless state, people will tear each other apart and feed on each other's entrails in an endless war over nothing in particular. Yet, let us not allow politics and partisan power play blind us to the origins and causes of our poverty travel. For the avoidance of doubt, let me state that the desperate poverty that we have today has its roots in dispensations that came before the Buhari administration. Specifically, our ep epidemic of mass poverty dates back to the return of civil rule in our country. It is unfair to heap the responsibility for the prevalence of poverty and inequality on this or any one administration in the history of the country. The Buhari administration has correctly identified increasing poverty and inequality as one of the major impediments to national development. The president has committed himself and the administration to migrating at least 10 million Nigerians from abject poverty in the shortest possible time. I believe that the various ongoing social welfare schemes of the administration will ensure the achievement of these objectives and that success, successful administrations will take on the mantle of poverty reduction as a cardinal objective of state policy. Previous government efforts have also contributed in reducing poverty over the years. This include the community banks, rural banking and rural branch network, directorate of employment, net fund, directorate for roads and rural infrastructure, mass transit program, Keken Pay program. In spite of some of these schemes, however, the burden of poverty in Nigeria continues to weigh heavily on the nation. It is either that these schemes are not well thought out or the magnitude of resources committed to them is too meager to make any significant impact. Global perspectives. For the avoidance of doubt, I need to point out that Nigeria is not alone in being confronted by the burden of poverty and inequality. Other nations have confronted the problem with remarkable results that should spare us. Let me therefore point out the strides which three countries in identical circumstances as Nigeria have made in the battle against poverty in recent years. China, India, and Brazil. I think like these countries because until recently they were in identical socioeconomic circumstances as Nigeria, they all used to be third world countries with huge poor populations and struggling economies. The achievement of the Chinese in poverty reduction has been equated with a modern day miracle. According to the World Bank, a total of 850 million people have been lifted out of poverty in China in the last 20 years. The poverty rate fell from 88% in 1981 to 0.7% in 2015. This is poverty as measured by the percentage of people living on 1.90% dollars or less per day by 2011, but just in power parity terms. This translates into an average poverty reduction rate of 42 million people per annum. In total, the Chinese have reduced their poverty rate by over 60 percent of the population in 20 years. The achievement corresponded with a period of sustained economic growth. It adopted a strategy of focusing on the poorest people in the rural areas. It massively moved them from poor homes in the countryside to apartment blocks in urban areas. This is similar to the strategy adopted by the late Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister of Singapore, in tackling poverty among the slum dwellers of Singapore. This led to rapid urban renewal and the uplifting of the standards of hygiene and living among the former slum dwellers with a corresponding economic empowerment. They could now leverage the market value of their new apartments home to raise capital. Let me go to India. According to United Nations reports, in 10 years, 2006 to 2016, India has lifted a record of 273 million of its population out of poverty. This has been achieved through a series of rural development programs targeted at poverty alleviation in the rural areas as a priority. By targeting the rural areas, the Indian strategy resembles the Chinese one in general, but is distinct in being based on specific programs. There are four basic schemes in the Indian mode. First, there is the Rural Livelihood Mission, which guarantees the rural poor access to finance to increase household incomes Entitlement to rise, increase access to participation in the national economy through participating in banking and insurance services. It also incorporates participation in microcredit schemes for rural based small ventures. Secondly, there is the Mahamatama Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Act 2005, which is designed to guarantee the livelihood of rural people. 
It's an employment guarantee scheme that assures individuals of a minimum of 100 days minimum wage employment. Let me jump. Thirdly, there is a rural housing guarantee scheme designed to provide housing for all by the year 2022. The Brazil. The poverty reduction strategy of Brazil is guided by a desire to improve the income of those at the bottom of the economic pyramid at a rate faster than those of people at the top, and also faster than the rate of GDP growth. The result is that Brazil has been able to, in the last two decades, to reduce both poverty and inequality simultaneously. Between 2003 and 2009, 21 million people have escaped poverty. The Brazil National Institute of Applied Economic Research says that the country's poverty incidence rate declined from 35.8% to 21.4% between 2001 and 2009, a period during which the country's Gini index, which measures rate of inequality, dropped by 9%, the lowest since the 1970s. Since major policy initiatives led to Brazil's success in this regard, first is the Balsa Economic Recovery Act of 1997, which was introduced in 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 1997, which was in return, families must ensure that they vaccinate their children, attend routine health programs, and ensure they keep their children in school. Compliance with these requirements is what assures people of continued participation and benefit from the program. This has helped in uplifting health standards as well as education participation among the poorest segments of the Brazilian population. This has been complemented by radical reforms in education that aim at expanding the level of education among less privileged Brazilians. The road ahead for Nigeria. From the foregoing perspectives from other major countries, some facts are clear and inalienable. Government must confront inequality through conscious, well thought, sustained, and sustainable policies. Such policies must be informed by the reality of the Nigerian situation, which I dare say remain unique and peculiar. In summary, there are areas that we must address if we hope to overcome our frightening inequality and poverty. We must free our policies from an urban based focus. The poorest urban Nigerian is many times better off than the most well-off rural Nigeria. Therefore, we need to emulate the Chinese and Indian examples in focus on the rural majority if we must end the increasing marginalization of our rural compatriots. Our current land title and tenure system have continued to consign our rural land owners to peasant holders of acres of land without commercial value. We need to reform our land title system by removing encumbrances on rural land titles so that rural farmers can use such land to access credit from the banks and credit unions. The digital revolution in the world offers us a unique opportunity to use technology to reduce poverty and inequality. Through the apps on our cell phones, a psychological inequality has been attacked. We should now use those very apps to transact business between the urban and the rural domains to transfer funds, admit credit, and fire aspirations. In all of it, politics and leadership has roles well cut out. There cannot be genuine democracy in a society divided by unequal access to the good things of life. The only possibility in that horizon is anarchy, which currently stares us in the face as tribal mobs and their lead talks now scramble for primacy on how to divide the country into tribal republics and personal estates. The democratic state must rise to the occasion by taking on the challenge of fighting poverty and inequality as a matter of urgent priority. The survival of, state, of the state and its very security are implicated in that necessary fight. A poverty reduced state with Unequal access to the good life is the image of the Hobbesian state of nature, where man has no dignity and hope is a mirage. In that place, life is short, brutish, and nasty. Mr. Vice Chancellor, the, pro, the Chancellor, and the visitor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for the privilege of your audience. God bless you. Uh, may we all stand and give a resounding ovation on behalf of the convocation to the Fortnite Convocation Lecturer. Thank you very much. Um, 
and thanks again to the 49th Convocation Lecturer. If I may take a minute, I may share the experience of the invitation. Um, after the Vice Chancellor decided that the 49th Convocation Lecturer was going to be the one, I had to, we sent him a letter and I had to make an effort to see him. And without an appointment, I went to his office. It was a particularly busy and difficult day for him because he was scheduled to take the COVID vaccine. And I feared that like most people after the COVID vaccine, he could go home and take a rest. He took the COVID vaccine and within hours he was back in the office. Please a round of applause. And when he was told that the professor was waiting to see him, he said, yes, I'll see him. And of all those that were waiting for, to see him, he saw me first. And I'm not talking about 6 a.m., 8 a.m. We're talking about 8 p.m. He was in the office when I left at a quarter past eight. And there were still people waiting to see him. So thank you so very much. The vice chancellor will make a presentation to the 49th Convocation Lecturer on behalf of the University of Nigeria. The vice chancellor, sir. The visitor ably represented His Imperial Majesty, the owner of FIFA, who is the Chancellor of the University of Nigeria. The Honorable Minister for Transportation and the Convocation Lecturer, the 49th Convocation Lecturer. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Council, Senate and Management of the University of Nigeria to present this plaque in commemoration of your lecture to the university today. Congratulations, sir. Yeah, he says, uh, yeah, he says, His Excellency, Right Honorable Ruti Misi Amechi, 49th Convocation Lecturer. Congratulations. Again, showing that, showing that this is the University of Nigeria and it's the only University of Nigeria and um, others. I know, I know the Honorable Minister won't agree with me. This is the product, one of the products of the University of Nigeria. We'll open it up. We'll open it. This is just one of the products of the University of Nigeria. And this is made in Nigeria. <laughs> Let's let's show the let's show the, the visitor and uh, Say that we should design something as a select building. 